thank you for clicking on my video. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite things I've ever grown called the pink banana squash or the North Georgia candy roaster squash. Um, context here is that I got my seeds from a seed exchange situation that one of our local nurseries put on a couple of years ago. It just said pink banana squash and I could only take a couple of seeds. It didn't have any image of what this squash would look like and I was a new grower so I just picked it and I thought I'll give it a try. It was a free seed exchange so how could you turn that away? Brought it home and I put it in my raised garden bed and um, wanted it to trellis over my archway because who doesn't love a trellising squash, right? So I grew it the first year that way and it came up so late that I had given up on it and actually didn't even realize it was coming up when it did come up. So after I got some fruit off of it, I could identify it, had a little help from a friend. Anyway, the story of the candy roaster squash begins on our farm. That year I only got two squash off of the vine that I grew and I didn't know if that was because it was bad seed or bad pollination or if I just didn't give it enough time. But the following year, so now we're up to last year, I grew it in my what I call flat garden because it's not in my raised beds, it's just all on our pasture with a layer of compost, a layer of cardboard and then a layer of wood chips and kind of a back to Eden style garden. Last year, oh man, I had so many squashes. It was overtaking my garden. It was great. Beautiful, huge, gigantic plant that climbed along the soil and shot out more roots along the vine. And I think that's why I got so many more fruit last year than the year prior because when I gave it that room to spread out and shoot more roots down into the wood chips, it was able to uh, soak up more water that way, just be stable, and I think all around a healthier vine. Now I also had six, seven, eight maybe seeds that I stuck in the ground for it, so I obviously had more than just one plant growing, but I ended up with over 50 squashes. Like these are big squashes, okay? Big, like this is a normal size one in an oval shape. But I had some that were really gigantic, weird, like pumpkin size looking guys. Here's what I learned about those. Okay, wait, pause for a second. What is this squash anyway? It's called a North Georgia candy roaster or a pink banana squash. It was the way the story goes. In the 1800s, it was an heirloom squash that was cultivated by the Cherokee Indians. So thank you guys for keeping this squash alive because it's amazing. It's sweeter than a regular pumpkin and it is a winter squash so it will last over winter. But you don't want to let it get frozen at all because that was my problem this year. I let it get a little too cold in the garage and didn't heat the garage or take the squash out and they got little cold spots and then those started to mold. So I had to deal with them probably a month earlier than if I had just allowed them to harden, not freeze, and they'd probably stay good for two, three, maybe, maybe three more months probably. Um, but alas, I just dealt with all of them, which is what this whole video is going to be all about. I canned up hundreds of pounds of this squash after we figured out how we liked it in recipes all winter. I didn't want any of it to go to waste. I wanted to see uh, how much of it we actually needed to keep in our canning pantry. So I knew how many I need to grow this following year to see how many I could sell or give away beyond just the needs of my family. So we're going to show you how you roast this thing, how you cook this thing into a soup, a Thai coconut milk curry type of soup and also how I can it as a puree, which is none of this is going to be an approved canning method because I'm pretty sure people will tell you you can't can the soup and I'm pretty sure people will tell you you can't can a puree, but you can watch my process and decide for yourself, your kitchen, your rules, my kitchen, my rules, if this is something that you're comfortable with. So, uh, let's see, I was gonna tell you about the different sizes of squash. So the giant squashes weren't as sweet. They were more watered down, like the kind of like how when you get an overgrown zucchini. 
isn't as good as a small zucchini. It's just more watery. The regular size squash, which are still like really big, really, really big, they were more sweet as they ripened in the garage, which is something I read online, but is actually true. I will vouch. They get sweeter the longer that you let them just ripen in the garage after you, they've been taken off the vine. And when they get that sweet, you can just cook it, puree it, and eat it with a spoon. It's so good. So if you like to bake with squash, if you just like to have squash soup, this is the number one best one because you have very little of that pumpkin-y, like taller, you have to tolerate the pumpkin squashy flavor. You almost have none of that. This is like sweetened baby food, delicious and sweet. So if you are interested, please continue forward with my video and I'll show you what's up on this side of the firmament. To save the seeds, I like to push them against a cutting board with my fingers and they kind of pop out. Then I can separate them away from the rest of the sludge. But another way you can do it is to just lift up the whole mass and pop the little seeds into your fingers and make them a pile. These seeds taste great. Heavily salted and slow roasted over three to four hours. Or you can just save the seeds and plant them in your garden the next year. Now I showed you in the video that I only baked these for an hour. It will start at an hour, but you might need to add 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You just need to cook them until they get so soft you can scoop this inner stuff out with just a mere spoon. See, I'm using just my tongs to just pull this flesh away. It doesn't stay stringy. It should just be kind of a mash, a puree already. So if you can flip them over and check to see if they've cooked to that softness or doneness, then you're good. That could take more than an hour. Um, sometimes it only takes an hour. It just depends on the squash, how large the squash is, and if it was able to create a nice dome of heat and pressure 
the way that you lay it on the cooking sheet. So I'm using a Vitamix blender. You don't want to burn your motor out on your blender or your mixer or whatever you're using. So I found that you can fill it most of the way with squash, but then you need to add some hot water or cold water if you're just going to put this in the fridge. Um, but about hot water to where it thins out enough that it will actually puree. So you will need to add some, probably check it and add a little bit more but you don't want to make it so thin that you water down the flavor of all of the squash. This is a good consistency for me, so check out this video, try to make yours look at least this thin or thick or however you look at it. This worked good. So you start with your eight cups of puree, and then you add two cans of either coconut cream or coconut milk. I prefer personally the coconut cream. I also have tried it with coconut milk. Any brand will do from Winco, Walmart, and Asian grocery store, it doesn't matter. It's pretty thick when it's still in the can, but if you can get it out and into your pot, you put it over heat and it will all thin out and that's when you'll know what the consistency of your soup is and how much of the upcoming step, chicken broth, you should add. I usually just make a chicken broth out of powdered chicken bouillon or this is another brand of chicken base, same kind of concept. You can use chicken broth that you've made at home, it just doesn't matter, although I would suggest that you make it kind of strong in flavor if you can. Um, if you can't, you may just have to add more flavors later on, which we'll talk about. And mainly this is to thin out the soup, so you only add as much as you need so that you re reach the consistency that you want. Next step is a very important step. It's this yellow curry paste, which maybe not everyone will be able to find locally, but I'm sure you can buy it online. It's an excellent product that lasts a really long time once you buy this tub. I'm pretty sure it's what most restaurants use for their yellow curry. It says yellow curry paste is the blending between Thai herbs and spices with Indian spices, especially turmeric, which provides yellow color to the paste. It's the only curry paste that contains no shrimp paste. It is normally used with coconut milk for preparing curry soup. And the ingredients are really simple. It's just garlic, lemongrass, salt, shallot, galagal, dried chili powder, coriander seed, slime peel, curry powder, cumin, cinnamon, turmeric, cardamom, and nutmeg. It's just a mashup of all of those spices in pretty much their rawest form. It makes this clump. When you first buy the tub, it's a lot more product, obviously, in that little bag. I showed you just the last amount that I had left. And to be honest, I don't really measure how much I usually put in my soup. So I made an estimate, and then I'm measuring it out here for you. It works out to be three tablespoons, but if you like your flavor spicier, or even if you want to start with less to see if that's going to be too strong for your family, this is where you're allowed to totally experiment 
in your own household. So that you can evenly distribute these seasonings into your whole pot of soup, you need to add a little bit of your soup into this little side bowl to make a sort of a seasony roux. So you just mix in those seasonings, thin it out a bit, so that when you put it in your whole pot, you can evenly distribute it. last ingredient is just a couple of these true lemon packets or you can use fresh lemon you can use vinegar this step is just to add an acidifier so lime will be all right uh, anything citrus something acidic it will all work together and bring out those flavors the way that you'll want it to taste at this point you're gonna have to taste it to see if it needs a little more of something else my opinion on this batch of soup was that it needed a stronger, more savory chicken broth flavor, so I whipped up a really small amount of fluid, but in a very strong flavor of chicken broth. And I also thought it needed a little bit more of that acidic flavor, so I put one more packet of true lemon in. This soup can have peanut butter, quinoa, vegetables, beans, meat, anything you'd like to add into it at the time of serving would be delicious. But for now, we're just gonna leave it as the base because we're gonna can it up. I pulled down as many different commercial jars from my shelves as I could for this video because I wanted to definitely check for myself how many of these commercial jars would hold up in the pressure canner, not just take other people's word for it. And also, I'm running out of jars. It's getting late in the canning season, so. Follow along. So remember the puree that we made before we made it into soup? Yeah, we're also going to can that today. Because I have so many of these squash, I can't make it all into soup. It would just take up everything and then I wouldn't have the option to use it for breads or other recipes. So I left it the consistency of the puree we made back earlier. I did not add any more water to thin it out anymore. I just poured it into pint jars because that's what I decided to use. I have mostly pints left, so all of the regular squash that I made is all in pints. And then I canned it. I personally would not have any problem canning a quart jar of squash puree. Like I said, it's just that I don't have very many quart jars left at this time. So I'm keeping it at pints, which will yield me about two cups of puree for any given recipe I might need it for later. I know it's gonna be a wonderful time when I finally reach a heavenly place. When the gates swing open and I walk in the city and I look at his blessed face. But all of the happiness, thrill, and joy had been reserved for that day. I get to feel a pretty good singing about it and spend a good trip on the way. I decided to put regular size canning jar lids in the bottom of my pressure canner this time instead of using the tray that came with it because I needed the tray that came with it for a different canner that I was using. So if you need something to put in the bottom of your pressure canner, that's a great option. In doing my research for how long to cook this pumpkin puree or pumpkin soup, 
I decided that I would start with a 10 minute vent of course and then in closing my gauge and bringing my canner up to pressure I would then start a cook time of 60 minutes for pint jars or 75 minutes for quart jars. I did not show you in this video how previously I canned this squash in cubes. This I'm showing you is the jar of puree. I want you to notice how full it is. And this is my quart jar of cubes. And when I shake it up here, you'll notice how much empty space is still left in the jar. And that's my biggest problem with doing it the official way by cubing the squash and canning it in the jar in cubes. If you just lose so much space that it's not even worth it almost. This is soup that I did before any of this that I've videoed. I experimented with this whole process before putting it on YouTube obviously. Here's another jar of puree that I did before this video and you can see that it also has lost some volume but I found that it's just siphoning that happens during the canning process. When it's in a puree already, anything that siphons out is just water. So it's still what I'm going to be calling two cups of puree for any given recipe. And if I want it to be more pumpkin-y, then I'll just add two pint jars. So overall, my favorite way of preserving this squash is by pureeing it or making it into a soup like I've shown you here. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day, oh, happy day, when Jesus was.